first case I'd like to talk about, it's one that I can't really document, but it's too good to leave out. And it's by uh, A.J. Liebling, uh, the great New Yorker uh, columnist, and I, I would recommend him to anyone who likes good, liter good, good literature and very, very funny, well-written pieces. Uh, it's the story of the Great American Hog Syndicate, led by Harry Broleski and Colonel John Stingo, who is known as the Honest Rainmaker. Liebling's book uh, is about the, includes this story. See, the, the Hog Syndicate, <laughs> headquartered in the Crocker Building, this happened during World War I. Now, during wars, and especially in, in World War I, the price of meat, especially the price of pork, goes way up because governments are buying this to feed their soldiers. So the syndicate offered the public a chance to literally grow their profits. So for $200, the hog syndicate investor could invest in a hog. The syndicate agreed to maintain the sow in regional splendor at a 1,600-acre farm in the Santa Clara Valley. Then, to get publicity uh, and a brilliant use of this, they offered $6,000 to buy Alexis II, who was a 1,000-pound gold cup winner at the New York State Fair. It was the highest price ever offered on a boar. So this would be a stud boar. It's like, you know, it's like paying the Kentucky Derby winner to, to be a stud horse. And uh, this got them extensive and free newspaper coverage. Money poured in, and they even expanded the uh, farm to 4,000 acres. So for the next three years, investors received generous dividends from their investments as the price for pork continued to rise. Then it came time for what they call in the cons, the blow off. When the price of pork reached 79 cents a pound, the syndicate, the syndicate announced that it had lost its lease and was shutting down operations. And, he, and they said that investors needed to retrieve their pigs from the farm in the next three weeks. <laughs> now, when the investors recovered from their shock and read their stock certificate, they realized that they had invested in the pigs, not in the operation. A week later, investors were informed that if they did not pick up their pigs, they would be liable for any damage caused by them. <laughs> then the next week, investors learned that out of nothing but pure generosity, the syndicate was willing to buy their pigs at 20 cents a pound. So the syndicate received a check for $512,000 from Swift & Company. Unfortunately, Harry Berleski skipped town with the check and lost it all on a horse race. <laughs> Berleski's horse finished eighth in the field of nine. <laughs> the ninth horse broke his leg. I want to talk about the great diamond hoax. Now this was the perfect con. It's just no widows and orphans were created, and only the mighty were brought down. What happened in the late 1870, Philip Arnold and John Stack, who were two weather-beaten miners, appeared at the Bank of California with a small leather sack to deposit in the vault. And after they were, the, they were questioning, they reluctantly revealed that it contained uncut diamonds and showed a few samples, but they refused to say anything else. Soon, word got it back to the bank president, William Ralston, about a diamond mine of fabulous proportions. Ralston offered to buy the claim, but the miners agreed only to sell a small interest for $100,000. Now, as part of the deal, they allowed two investigators to accompany them to the mine. And the investigators were blindfolded on the trip, so they couldn't know the mine's location. They returned to Ralston with glowing reports and handfuls of diamonds and rubies. At this point, Ralston contacted his friend Asbury Harpington, who was in London, and asked him to take charge of the new enterprise. Now, Asbury's life was even more interesting than his name. Born in Kentucky in 1839, Asbury made his first fortune mining in California. During the Civil War, he was a Southern sympathizer, and he <coughs> developed this conspiracy uh, to be a pirate in San Francisco Bay. The idea was, you know, 
a great deal of the cost of the Union side of the Civil War was paid for by gold from California. So their idea, he, he bought a boat, he outfitted it with guns, and his idea was to pirate, take over a ship, and then sail it to the Confederacy. But his plan was exposed and he was caught by the Coast Guard. His fortune was confiscated, but he served only a few months in jail. And after the war, he made another fortune in railroads and in the stock market. So Harpington was in London selling shares in a silver mine when Ralston's telegram reached him. He quickly returned to Reno, Nevada, just in time to meet Arnold and Slack, who were returning from the mine with another bag of gems. Harpington took the bag from the miners, went to his mansion, where in front of Ralston and other investors, he poured the bag's contents onto his billiard table. Diamonds, emeralds, and sapphires poured onto the table in front of the dazed observers. Things moved quickly after that. Arnold and Slack were called in and finally persuaded, you, you can't develop this mine. You don't have the money. We'll, we'll take it over. And they were offered $600,000, which is worth about $11 million today. But, you know, Ralston's group, he, he still wanted to be careful, so he did two more things. He sent, uh, Harpington sent some of the gem samples to Tiffany's, yes, that Tiffany's in New York. And uh, Charles Tiffany estimated the value at about $100,000. Um, then Ralston sent mining expert Henry Jannon, who was taken again blindfolded. And Jannon was amazed at the amount of diamonds. And, and he was just blown away by all this. And his enthusiastic report clinched the deal. Arnold and Slack received their $600,000. The San Francisco and New York Mining Company was formed with a who's who list of partners, including England's Baron Rothschild, General George McClellan, and, and a number of very wealthy people. 25 friends of the Ralston Group were allowed to buy shares at $80,000 and each one of them were deluged by people wanting to buy it for a lot more. It was like trying to get into Facebook before it went public. <laughs> you know. So just about this time, Clarence King, who was the US government geologist for the Western states, he heard about the rumors and he found the site. Now, as a geologist, he found a number of strange things. He knew that diamonds and emeralds were never found together in nature. They're created by totally different processes. And he found a diamond, it was like, this diamond mine was so accommodating, not only did it produce diamonds, but it cut them. <laughs> you know, this diamond had the marks of the jewelers. So, he uh, telegraphed Rolfson's company that they had been swindled and the fields had been salted with diamonds. Now, a, a detective agency found that Arnold had purchased $50,000 worth of poor grade diamonds in Amsterdam and London in 1870. When these facts were revealed, Slack had disappeared, but Arnold was located in Kentucky where he had purchased a very large house and land. Now, Arnold accused the big California bankers of trying to cheat him, and his Kentucky friends closed ranks around him. So the bank's attorney, realizing the futility of winning a case in Kentucky, <laughs> accepted a $150,000 settlement. Now, when Arnold died of pneumonia six years later, more than $200,000 was missing from his estate. Of course, the press had a field day with the stories of how the big shot bankers were hoodwinked by old miners, but it was hard to fault their research. You know, the diamonds were examined by the country's leading jeweler, and the mine was examined by a, a leading mine expert. But it turned out that Charles Tiffany was an expert in finished stones. He didn't really know much about raw stones. And that Janin was an expert in gold and silver mining, but he knew nothing about the geology of diamond mining. But still, you know, this is like a great con where the, your, your target are begging you to take their money. You just, you know, you, you have to beat them off and they keep coming back after you. So, you know, still imagine the iron nerve it must have taken to pull off the scam and the luck it needed to make sure the real experts weren't called. Unless it wasn't luck. Some suspected that Harpington might have been involved, 
But he always denied it. In 1916, Harpington wrote The Great Diamond Hoax, which has become the standard text on the case. But he might have left something out. In 1944, some of Harpington's old correspondence came to light. One of the letters, written in 1871 by a close friend, refers to a Mr. Arnold of Kentucky and asks, this is Harpington, and this is Clarence King. So um, one of the other letters says, can you send me one of the African rough diamonds? Now, take a look at this picture of Harpington. I think I see a $200,000 twinkle in his eyes. <laughs> the next, this is, oh, this is, yeah, more information about it. Uh, this is a little Jewish history that will probably not be covered in the uh, talk next month. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. In February 1888, Bertha Stanley visited Dr. Messing, chief rabbi of Beth Israel Congregation, and she told the rabbi that she had inherited $300,000 from her husband, who was Christian, but she wanted her next marriage to be someone of Jewish faith. And she offered $1,000 to the person who would find her a thoroughly acceptable Jewish husband. She visited Dr. Messing frequently and met his brother-in-law, Abraham Grun, a wealthy businessman. Now, she was described by the Chronicle as being 40 years of age, decidedly ugly, and weighing 250 pounds. <laughs> but what she lacked in looks, she made up with charisma. Grun fell in love with her and proposed marriage within a few days. Soon, Bertha had charmed her way into the top social class of Beth Israel, giving a check for $1,000 to the congregation. She hinted at a lot more money to come from her. She was a guest of honor at many soirees and managed to, inquire, uh, to acquire a, an extensive wardrobe, including jewelry, either, at, either as gifts or on credit. She borrowed $500 from Grun and then departed to Los Angeles. Now, when Bertha's check bounced, Grun became suspicious and visited captain of detectives Isaiah Lees. If you don't know, I say Lee is, is probably the greatest detective you never heard of. He was chief of detectives for 40 years. He was internationally known. There was, uh, there was a portrait of him in Scotland Yard. So um, upon hearing Bertha's description, Lee's reached for a book. Turn to photograph number 122 and showed it to Groon. Is this the woman, he inquired? The shocked groom nodded his assent. The book was Professional Criminals of America by New York City Chief of Detectives Thomas Burns. The description read Bertha Hyman, alias Big Bertha, Confidence Queen. The book written in 1886 detailed her many swindles. She has the reputation of being one of the smartest confidence women in America, uh, wrote Burns, and added adding, she possesses a wonderful knowledge of human nature and can deceive those who consider themselves particularly shrewd in business matters. Mm -hmm. Now, Bertha put it this way, the moment I discover a man's a fool, I let him drop. But I delight in getting into the confidence and pockets of men who think they can't be skinned. It, ministru, it ministers to my intellectual pride. <laughs> Now, a warrant for her arrest was issued, and she was captured in Texas and returned to San Francisco. But as any great con artist, she was very calm, and she was the picture of outraged innocence, and she soon became a press favorite. Now, impresario Ned Foster saw an opportunity, and he launched Bertha into a successful theatrical career <laughs> after bailing her out of jail. He booked her into Woodward's Garden, which was a very popular place at that time, and 18,000 people streamed in to see her and hear her paint herself as the victim in her poem, The Confidence Queen. <laughs> so in vain grasping men pant for glittering gold and find their bonanza in me, 
Is it wicked to show up how badly they're sold and the rogues that men sometimes can be? She was acquitted in the trial. Actually, a lot of the charges she was acquitted because the men were too embarrassed to testify. <laughs> Um, but Bertha's career continued with the booking in the Bella Union, which was San Francisco's most popular music hall. And she discovered that her lack of talent was no barrier to popularity. <laughs> uh, she was known as, a, as an actress who couldn't act, a singer who couldn't sing, and a dancer who couldn't dance. She was paired with Oofty Goofty. Um, Oofty Goofty was, was a Barbary Coast character who made his living this is true, as a human punching bag. It's like for a, dom you know, for, for a dollar you could hit him. Uh, more and more money you could do even worse things to him. Um, they staged boxing matches on stage during which she would invariably knock him out. <laughs> then, in a stroke of comic genius, Bella and Ufti were cast as the title characters in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> They did have to make a few changes in the staging. Uh, due to Bertha's weight, the tender love scene on the balcony was played with Ufti in the balcony <laughs> and Bertha on the ground. Uh, Bertha's career had a low point a few years later when she played Mazeppa, which was a very famous 19th century popular play. And in one scene, she was strapped to a donkey on stage. Uh, she and the donkey fell into the orchestra pit and wiped out, <laughs> wiped out two-thirds of the orchestra. <laughs> Shortly later, she disappeared from sight. Oh. Oh. Maybe she stole the orchestra. She, it could be. Ah, Andrew John Gibson, a.k.a. Sir Harry Westwood Cooper, a.k.a. Sergeant Major Swinton Holm, also known as Dr. Milton Abraham, also known as Ebenezer McKay, was the most industrious con man. With a regal presence and forged documents, he cut a swath of larceny on four continents, leaving a trail of counterfeit checks and at least 12 swindled wives. Born in Australia in 1868, Gibson spent his first 20 years in England. Returning to Australia, he, he posed as the heir to a large British fortune and married the daughter of a wealthy businessman. After cashing some worthless checks, he took his wife to London, where he abandoned her. Moving on to Toronto, he became Dr. Harry Westwood Cooper, and showing forged newspaper clippings, which attested to his miraculous surgical techniques. He disappeared after borrowing large sums of money and arrived in San Francisco in 1897 as Sir Harry Westwood, MD, having been knighted by the queen of his imagination. <laughs> he was arrested here after forging a check on the Crocker Woolworth Bank and served three years in San Quentin. <coughs> Upon his release, he became Dr. Milton Abraham. Soon he was arrested again. Even prison could not impair his connubial criminality. He seduced a mercenary who visited the prison and married her under the nose of the San Francisco jailers. Gibson was so persuasive that jailers were not to talk with him lest they fall under his spell. He once said, give me a shave and a clean shirt and I can win the affection of any woman in the world. After leaving San Francisco, Gibson continued his career abroad. He was arrested in South Africa under the name of Ebenezer McKay and in Australia as Sergeant Major Home. Now, Gibson may have been a skilled con man, an expert forger, forger, but he was no master criminal and spent over 40 years in prison. <laughs> in June 1940, while posing as Dr. Harry Cecil Darling in a, matern in a London maternity hospital, he was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 10 years. As Walter Thomas Poirot, he married a 58-year-old widow named Bessie and died in Brisbane, Australia in 1952. He was so reviled by Bessie's family 
that the couple's headstone reads only Bessie died 25th June 1957 and her husband. <laughs> But his story did not end there. In 1997, his great-great-grandson, Steve Wilson, claimed that Gibson, who was in London in 1888, was really Jack the Ripper. The claim sounds doubtful, but with Gibson, anything was possible. And I also want to say that uh, uh, Andrew John Gibson is one of the cards in my uh, uh, Crooks Tour trading card collection, which I'm selling over there for the, for the next to nothing price of $10. Um, so, going on. Dr. Albert Abrams. Now, there's a fine line between a quack and a visionary. Nikola Tesla and Joseph Lister, who were ridiculed crossed that line when the discoveries were proven to be true. Dr. Albert Abrams also crossed that line, but he was going in the opposite direction. <laughs> he was a most unlikely candidate for such a voyage. Abrams was born in San Francisco in 1863, and his brilliance was recognized at an early age. When he was only 19, Abrams received a medical degree from the University of Heidelberg, then the finest medical school in the world. Abrams continued his studies in the capitals of Europe and returned to California to begin his practice. In 1893, he became a full professor of pathology and director of the medical clinic of Cooper Medical College, which later became Stanford Medical School. From 1904 until his death, Abrams was president of the Emanuel Clinic. He helped pioneer new medical devices such as x-rays and fluoroscopes. Adams became a recognized expert in the field of neurology, and his books on diseases of the heart and clinical diagnosis became standards in the field. But as time went on, Abrams became critical of the German-dominated medical establishment. But it wasn't until his discovery of spondylotherapy in 1908 that he made the trip from Visionary Heights to Quack Valley. Quack Valley. The early 20th century was a time of great developments and competing theories in medicine. Electricity was still a new discovery and was thought by many to have curative powers. Then, of course, there were alternative medical approaches such as chiropractics and osteopathy which believed that hosts of diseases could be cured by bone and muscle manipulation. Abrams' invention, spondylotherapy, combined both elements. Abrams claimed that careful and repetitive stimulation of the spinal column using an electric vertical percussive vibrator could diagnose almost mo all medical problems. But Abrams was just getting started. He then invented the dynamizer, an amazing machine that could, based on a single drop of blood from a patient, determine not only the illnesses which the patient was afflicted, but the patient's, patient's age, sex, race, and even religion. <laughs> Maybe even his bowling score, I don't know. So Abrams would place, this is a great, Abrams would place the blood sample in the dynamizer, which was connected to the forehead of a healthy male lab assistant, who stood stripped to the waist, facing west under dim lighting conditions. <laughs> it was all very scientific, you know. The dynamizer was switched on, and Abrams tapped the abdomen of his lab assistant, interpreting the vibratory patterns this produced into his diagnosis and personality profile. Then, Abrams came up with a new machine, the acyloclast, which could cure whatever disease the dynamizer identified. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, um, Abrams theorized that every disease has its rate of vibration, and that drugs that treat these diseases also have a definite vibration rate. So by adjusting the acyloclast to the frequency of the disease, it would counter the disease and cure the patient. 
he modestly called this practice ERA, or Electrical Reactions of Abrams. Now, rather than sell the oscilloclast, which were nicknamed magic boxes, <laughs> Abrams leased them to future practitioners. These practitioners, who paid $200 for training, agreed to kick back a percentage of their profits and to never open the boxes. <laughs> As the money rolled in, Abrams bought a mansion in Seacliff and furnished it with a library of rare books, a pipe organ, and an impressive, impressive collection of Asian art. Now, though the medical establishment was outraged, the press was delighted. Dr. Abrams looked and sounded impressive. He made amazing claims, and his stories sold newspapers. So the newspapers took the, uh, the Fox News balanced approach. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than investigating the truth of his claims, they would give the Medical Association a paragraph to attack Abrams. Then they would give Abrams three paragraphs to, persuade, <laughs> to portray himself as a pioneer besieged by jealous competitors. Of course, that kind of shoddy journalism could never happen today. <laughs> in 1921, 50 years before DNA testing, a Superior Court judge used the results of Abrams' um, oscillator to determine a child's legitimacy. The judge's action inspired a strong opposite reaction from the scientific community. A Dr. Buckley sent Abrams a sample of his own blood and that of his son and asked Abrams to determine the child's paternity. Abrams tested the blood and claimed that the sample was not human. <laughs> Buckley replied, what am I, a fish? <laughs> and he took the story to the newspapers. Scientific Americans spent a year investigating Abrams' claims. They sent an ERA practitioner six vials, each containing a germ culture of a specific disease, and asked him to analyze the vials. Now, um, the practitioner was amazing. He did not get a single one right. <laughs> For example, he identified the vial containing Permanococcus as a combination of syphilis, tuberculosis, streptococcus, malaria, and the flu. <laughs> now, uh, when Nobel Prize winner Professor R. A. Milliken examined the oscilloclast later, he said, you know, it might have been thrown together by a 10-year-old boy who knows a little about electricity to mystify an 8-year-old boy <laughs> who knows nothing about it. <laughs> The man who built the boxes told investigators that Abrams paid him $30 per box and told him that the arrangement of wires inside was not important. <laughs> <laughs> Under pressure and in failing health, Abrams made another prognostication. He predicted that he would die in 1924. And on January 14th of that year, he was proven correct. Now, Abrams left the bulk of his multi-million dollar estate to build a college of electrical medicine. But without Abrams' personality, electrical medicine fizzled and the proposed college became a hotel. But you know something? Great ideas never die, as long as there is someone to buy them. And ERA is now known as the field of radionics. You will find over 50 videos on YouTube explaining this science and offering devices. Many prestigious medical institutions, such as the Radionics and Dowsing Institute of Canada, <laughs> teach this subject. Here's one explanation. Radionics devices have generators that harness electron wave transfer on a large scale that we link to the scalar waves we as human beings generate naturally to transfer the energy to a specific purpose. Uh, who understand? Anyone understand that? <laughs> if you do, I have a great investment for you. Now, we all know that the current occupant of the White House is a big fan of privatization of roads, bridges, everything. And I may ask the videographer to take out the section in post-production because if this got out, it would really ruin your financial opportunity here. <laughs> So I happen to have a source high up in the administration. 
and I can get you on the bottom floor here. <laughs> Coming soon, in beautiful steampunk design. <laughs> <laughs> the Brooklyn, I mean the Trump Bridge. Well, that is as my presentation. And I will take any questions. <laughs>